Laura. Welcome, Laura. Laura has never presented to our group today, so this is a great opportunity to bring new speakers. Laura Warner is a registered physiotherapist with specific training in management and treatment of pelvic floor, abdominal, urogynecological, gynecological, and lumbar pelvic dysfunctions. This is tough at the end of the day to do this. <laughs> she earned her uh, Master's of Physiotherapy degree from the University of British Columbia in 2008. After taking postgraduate courses in pelvic floor rehabilitation, she sought the training of Marcy Diane, who has taught and worked extensively in this field. Laura mentored intensively with Marcy and was, joined, was asked to join her practice. She worked at the highly regarded Diane Physiotherapy and Pelvic Floor Clinic for five years. In the summer of 2015, Laura and her family relocated to beautiful Vancouver, and she established her practice at Shelburne Physiotherapy. So please join me in welcoming Laura. All right, thank you very much. And thank you, Adam Mosse Center and Sheldon, for helping me come here and present to the group. Um, for questions, I, let's just keep it open and free. And if you have any questions, just throw up your hand and we'll just kind of fly by the seat of our pants. Does that sound okay? Okay. So uh, let's see what else. I do want to credit, as, uh, I, was, as I was introduced, Marcy Diane. Um, she's my mentor in Vancouver who's been working in this area for about 20 years now with both men and women. And she works at the Prostate Center group, I don't know if I'm going to call it correctly, in, at, in Vancouver, where there's uh, three physiotherapy sessions included as part of their treatment care. And I believe that the Island Prostate Center and different groups are working together to try and get that happening here in, on Vancouver Island. Um, so I've practiced with Marcy in her clinic in Vancouver for five years and, and I've just relocated like, like uh, my, uh, I forget your name. It's Leanne. Leanne, thank yeah. you, had yeah. introduced me, <laughs> yes. So um, this is what I do, I treat from here to here. If you have a sore shoulder or neck, I send you somewhere else to another physio. If you have a sore knee, I've, I've had knee injuries and ankle injuries myself, so I can I can get you started, but I usually shoot you off to another physiotherapist. I, so it basically abdominal, lumbopelvic dysfunction, um, urinary incontinence being one of them, which is a common side effect that can happen, a common morbidity after radical prostatectomy. Uh, so we'll speak to that directly today. Okay, where's my mouse? Everybody ready? So, <laughs> prostatectomy and bladder control, learn how to take an active role. So, so what does that mean? Um, in a therapist's definition, there's active therapy and there's passive therapy. Uh, passive therapy is something that is that's something that's done to you. So say for example, if you go to a physiotherapy clinic and they put on um, little um, sensors on your body that sends tingling that reduces your pain or puts on a hot pack. So, or you go to a chiropractor and they do an adjustment. So that's passive therapy, somebody else giving a treatment to you. Active therapy is becoming active in your, and being active in your participation of your treatment. So understanding what's going on. Um, the mechanisms of, of what things are supposed to be doing, what is not working properly, how to help yourself, and how to learn how to use your body to help bring relief to yourself. So you, I'm, I'm essentially teaching you how to help yourself, which is actually really quite exciting and quite rewarding because it's, it's more empowering for you. You get more information, more education, and especially rewarding working in this area of practice because these, these troubles that happen post-prostatectomy, um, and in women's health as well, can be very bothersome and, and not talked about. And like Leanne and I were talking earlier, a lot of men, I'm sure, uh, suffer in silence and don't talk about it. And it's, it's really quite common, and there's lots you can do about it, and lots you can do with properly done exercises, so that's my job. So, how to take an active role. So I'm hoping at the end of this session that the participant will understand the pelvic floor in terms of bladder control mechanisms, how it's supposed to work. Uh, the effects of external beam radiation, brachytherapy, and bladder concerns. So it was the zipper or the, what was it that you had said? The glow in the dark, was that what you said? Yes, exactly, that was good, I hadn't heard that. Um, how prostate surgery affects continence, and what Kegels are, or Kegels, 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 tomato, tomato, <coughs> and what pelvic floor contraction is. So how the bladder is supposed to work. So, Pre-surgery, pre any troubles, what happens is that this big blue circle is supposed to be the bladder. The skinny little uh, line, or the, the blue line coming down is the urethra, so where the pee comes out. 
It's really hard to see, but there's some red dashed line at the bottom. That's your pelvic floor muscles. So what's supposed to happen when the bladder is empty? It's, it's a hollow organ, and so when it's empty, it's collapsed down. And when it fills with urine, it expands in all different directions. And what's supposed to happen? It's supposed to wait and fill and fill and fill, wait till it's got a certain amount of fullness in the bladder. And at that volume, the bladder gives a little spasm that tells the person it's full and that it would like to be emptied. Now, ideal control, if you're in a meeting or in a presentation, or if you go to the bathroom and there's someone there, we want to have the ability to hold that and hold our bladder and feel calm and in control until the time is ideal to go. So that's, that's <coughs> optimal bladder control. So there's different types of incontinence that can occur, and urinary, uh, urinary urgency-related incontinence can often happen with external beam radiation or brachytherapy that the glow in the dark. Um, so when they implant the radioactive seeds uh, for treatment, it can irritate the bladder. Um, and so what can happen sometimes is instead of, let's see if this will go, yes, instead of uh, the bladder giving a calm signal that it wants to go, it's more irritated, so it almost like has a temper tantrum, really urgent, really panicky, so the urge can come fast all of a sudden, feel like you've got to go now, you might be pushing people out of the way. Um, so so that, that can be a side effect of the, the radiation or the, the brachytherapy. Um, so what you can experience sometimes is burning with urinating uh, frequency, so having to go more often than usual, and the volumes that when you go might be small. Um, urgency, I mean, <coughs> panicky urge, I gotta go now. Uh, and there's been shown that there can be incontinence related to the urgency that can occur for four to eight weeks thereafter, but this can be time limited, meaning that by the end of four to eight weeks, it's resolved. So they know that we know that it's a specific occurrence to the to the glow of the dark seeds, um, and that it's it's time limited. So how to differentiate this type of incontinence compared to what can happen after radical prostatectomy, which I will go into more detail, is that the incontinence that can happen with this is related to the bladder having a temper tantrum. So those big red lines, like a child, two-year-old on the floor, kicking and screaming that it wants a popsicle. The, the bladder is having a temper tantrum that it really wants to go, and if the pelvic floor muscles aren't strong enough to withstand the temper tantruming of the bladder, then there can be a leak. But really, the root of the problem is the glow in the dark seeds that are irritating it, but it's part of the treatment. So it's, it's like a side effect that happens. So there are different treatments for this. You can speak to your physician about different types of medication that are called anticholinergic. So they act on the muscle, the bladder muscle itself, and it can reduce its contractility so it doesn't have so much of a spasm. Um, there are some dietary things that you can do as well. So often, uh, a lot of people are familiar with coffee for sure, so any caffeine, tea, sometimes spicy foods, citrus, um, tomatoes, sometimes spinach, strawberries, artificial sweeteners, so there's different things that can, can create more urgency within the bladder. Um, increasing fluids, which sometimes sounds absolutely backwards to people who are saying, I gotta go, I gotta go right now. They say, well, Laura, didn't you hear me? I say, I have to go, I have to go right away. Uh, and you're telling me to drink more water. But what happens is that when you increase your fluids, your water intake, you actually dilute the urine that's in your bladder, which actually makes it less irritating and is more soothing. So it sounds backwards, but actually drinking more water makes it more comfortable. And then when you get to the bathroom, it's actually worth it because you've got a bigger one to go. Does that make sense? As a side note, or as a, as a, I just want to step aside for a second, I do sometimes talk a bit fast, so slow me down if you need me to slow down and get kind of going. But everybody okay so far? Yes. So, uh, how soon after the procedure does the incontinence generally set in? That's actually a really good question. I think it's pretty close to immediate. I think it's, it might be a week or two, I'm not entirely sure, but I don't think there's much because it's, it's that's how it works is that's giving up that yeah yeah but from the information that i was given that it it is gone after about eight weeks or so um there are some cognitive behavioral things that we can teach as well too it, it's almost like parenting your bladder just like you would parent a child so uh i give information about that as well um, and how to use your pelvic floor to help calm your bladder down it's really neat because our pelvic floor muscles have a, they're under our voluntary control. So just like we can contract our biceps or contract our quadriceps to straighten our leg, our pelvic floor muscles that are at the bottom of the pelvis here, we have the ability to volitionally control them. So be able to, with our brain, say to these muscles, tighten up. So these muscles, they talk to the bladder muscle. The bladder muscle 
is a different type of muscle called a smooth muscle, which is the same, similar type of muscle that our heart's made of, or our intestines are made of. So we can't tell our heart to beat, it beats on its own. We can't talk to our bladder directly and say, contract or relax, but we can talk to our pelvic floor and contract it, and the pelvic floor sends a message to the bladder that tells it, shh, calm down little nutty, it's okay. <laughs> relax. And so it's really neat, it really can work, and here's the tricky part, is that these pelvic floor contractions aren't easy. And we don't have research on men uh, for this particular, uh, on doing Kegels, we have it on women, but in my practice what I've seen in the, the six and a half years I've been practicing is it's pretty much about the same. Based on verbal and written instruction, so someone telling you how to do a Kegel, or reading on a piece of paper, or reading on the internet, or out of a book, so based on verbal and written instruction, when they assessed women with incontinence and did an actual exam, they found that greater than 75% of them were doing them incorrectly. So that's a lot. Mm -hmm. So and you can imagine how why it's so difficult, because these muscles are deep within our bodies, and if you're doing it correctly, you actually shouldn't see anything from the outside. So if someone's doing a squat, a physiotherapist should be able to say, okay, um, you know, if you're squatting like this, okay, maybe lift your chest up and open your knees and, and bring your arms up so I can cue on, on how to do it. And someone from the outside can see, but with a Kegel, it's deep inside. So it can be pretty tricky. I'll do my best and I'll give my instruction about how uh, we usually find the best results. But if you're at any time thinking, I don't know if I'm getting this right, know that you're not alone and know that there's somewhere you can go. And, and that's a big part of my job is I do exams and assessment and teach people how to do it correctly. Um, Laura? Yes. Yeah. When I was, after my surgery, yeah. uh, one of the things that the doctor had me do was uh, pay a visit to the nurse and right. she said, drop your drawers yeah. and it was like she's going to uh, do a digital exam. Yes. And same motions for her, yes. but she had me practice the Kegels there so she was able to tell whether I was doing, doing the, it uh, right or not. Doing it right or not. Exactly. Because that's the only way to tell if someone's doing it right is either with, uh, like for men specifically, a, a visual exam. Like you can get some information and I'll go through some of the next slides about what to look for, what we look for, but exactly exposing the area. So I visualize so I get men to undress and women to address if I'm assessing them too from the waist down. And so I visualize the perineum, so the area between, and I'll explain why I have a female model in a second. Uh, I, I um, visualize the perineum, so the area between the testicles and the anus. I watch the anus, I watch the buttocks, I watch the legs, I watch the abs, I watch the shoulders, I watch the, the eyebrows, right? A lot of different things try and come in when you try and do a Kegel. And so with visualization, I can watch to see if the person's getting it right with palpation, so by putting fingertips in this area, and you can do this as well too at home, I'll show you what to, where, like you put your fingers here, what to feel for. And then also you can assess with a digital rectal exam, absolutely. So putting a finger in the anus, and for women, finger uh, in the vagina, or the anus, depending on what's going on. So absolutely, so the, that's the gold standard way to assess and, and treat to make sure people are, are doing their kegels right. And then once you got it, you just go do them, but you gotta make sure you're doing them right. Because if you do the wrong, you do it, the cows come home and you won't get anywhere. And there's ways that you can do it wrong that'll actually make things worse. So we'll explain that. Yeah, thank you. Good question. Yes, great. Looking at that muscle. Yes. I have, uh, I don't know if it's other people have it also. Yeah. But when I'm sitting yeah. and I get up, I feel like I've been sitting on a frozen bicycle seat. Okay. Is it that muscle? Yeah, probably. And do you feel, do you mean that you feel decreased sensation, that it feels numb, or? No, it's cold. It's cold, okay. It feels like I've been sitting on ice. And you feel it as you're sitting, or you feel it as you stand up? Both. Both. Um, is it actually cold to touch? Do you know? I don't know. Yeah, who knows? Um, is it similar to if you've been, uh, does it feel pins and needly? No. No. Um, anyone else, if you're comfortable sharing if they've experienced that? It doesn't, I mean, what I'm guessing is possibly, and you can check with your physician and or Sean if you have any ideas, but there might be some, some nerve compression or some, some, does it matter how long you sit for or does it happen right away? Uh, yeah, it, it matters for how long I sit for. It. Yeah, so there's an onset. Like right now I'm comfortable. Yeah. But by the time I get up to go yeah. go home, yeah. I'll feel it. You'll feel it. After you stand up, how long does it take for it to go away? About five minutes. Five minutes or so, that's good. Um, any pain associated with it? No, not really. Okay. 
And this is only onset after surgery. I haven't had surgery. Okay. So there, there, yeah. there, there, I did have one thing a okay. couple of weeks ago. Yeah. I had Botox injections okay. in my bladder. Okay. So is, did it start after that? Don't it, was, it was doing it before, and it's okay. still doing it, so I, okay. I'm not too sure. Who was it that did the Botox for your bladder? Uh, Steinhoff. Steinhoff. I didn't know Steinhoff does that. Okay, good. Um, so he did it for urgency? Is that what he did? Uh, well, I have a, another okay. problem. Okay, so something else as well. Prostate. Okay, uh, so my guess it might be something neurological because sometimes they or or that blood is, flow related. That is part of the other problem. Yeah. MS. Yeah. Okay, so that may be it. So I run so it. The incontinence is yes. there even before you even start. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> and that's what's tricky. And I mean, when I see people that have multiple sclerosis or post radical prostatectomy or say after child delivery or when there's actually when there's been trauma to the area or neurological insult or improper neurological functioning. It, it, you might not have perfect control like someone who's not had any insult, but we can still optimize what you have left. And often, often you can get results even though you don't might not have perfect information or or there might be some trauma to the area. Um, so you never know until you come and assess it or and try these exercises properly. But yeah, my guess is something I would want you to follow up with your doctor just to double check. I'm happy that it's onset. It sounds something that there's some compression, whether it's nerve or blood vessel. I would personally look at um, cushions or seats that would offload, and there's different things. But yeah, we can chat after the break. But yeah, it's something in this area, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, Thank depression, you. though. Yeah, you're welcome. Hope that was on. Okay. Um, if you ever have difficulty urinating, see your doctor, absolutely. If you ever feel like you have to push to get the urine out, uh, see your doctor. Uh, and if you still persist to have incontinence two to five years after the radiation, uh, external brain radiation or brachytherapy, then uh, physiotherapy is absolutely appropriate. And uh, also follow up with your doctor. Okay. Okay, so the pelvic floor. I have a few female model up here. I apologize I don't have a male model. We have a male model in the Vancouver clinic. It wasn't a very good one. It fell apart. I really didn't, I really didn't like it. You'd pick it up and it would fall on the pelvic floor and then the prostate would fall and the bladder would fall. And it was just really just, it was not a very good model and they haven't really made a good one. So, so I would normally, I would say, I'm sorry, I have a male model and I do see men all the time, but, but we have a female, I have a female model, so, so vagina out and, and penis and testicles in. A lot of the muscles are the same. The ones are the most relevant anywho. So we'll go over the model here and on the, on the screen. If you don't have a pointer, is it okay if I go over to the screen? Okay, so um, here's the front of the body, so obviously penis, testicles. So here's the pubic bone. So this is the bone right at the front of the pelvis, so it's right there. And then at the back here, this is the sacrum and the tailbone. So that's back here, back here. So this is the rectum, and there's the bladder prostate, and then here's the urethra. You can see how it's passing through the prostate all the way down the penis and out. So the pelvic floor spans from the tailbone here, the sacrum, like a sling, all the way to the pubic bone. And for men, it's got two openings, opening for the anus, opening for the urethra. Everybody good so far, making sense? Okay, so, Come back to that in a second. So in the pelvic floor model here, we've got two layers of muscles. So here it is, like a sling. The deep layer, this one's like a bowl or a hammock. It's called levator ani, and as the name suggests, it supports the anus, the rectum, and the bladder, and for women, the uterus too. Then we've got a superficial layer of muscles. So for men, we've got external anal sphincter, external urethral sphincter, and muscles that come into the base of the penis and the testicle. So these deep muscles work together with the superficial muscles. Basically, they all work together. You can't separate out the layers. Here's where it gets confusing. There are different ways to cue or to tell a person where to think or how to think of doing a Kegel or a Kegel, which is essentially a pelvic floor contraction. So the most common one is a urinary cue, because if the trouble is incontinence, leaking urine, it makes sense to think of tightening as if you're holding pee. But here's the interesting part, is that for both men and women, when they think of tightening of their pelvic floor, for most people, it results in a 
less effective or subpar contraction. They might be getting the pelvic floor, but only a small version of what, what they're capable of getting. And for a lot of men and women, they actually get a better overall contraction of the entire pelvic floor, including the urethral sphincter, when they cue or think of tightening from the anus. So I say to people, just as a heads up, why I might say, we're gonna try different things, because everybody's a little bit different. And there are a small percentage of people that when they think of tightening like holding pee, they get a great contraction, but for most people, they actually get more oomph out of the entire pelvic floor when they think of tightening in from the anus. And whatever you do with the anus will happen at the urethra and then in this deep layer as well. So all of it works together. Now, some therapists say, and, and trainers say, that if you do a Kegel or a contraction and you're tightening from the anus, you feel the anus coming in, you're doing it wrong, they're wrong. The anus is totally part of the pelvic floor. You can see how it's all, all amazingly connected. So, mechanisms to keep the urine in. Two muscles, external urethral sphincter. So sphincter being circumferential like a circle and urethra passing through it. So the external urethral sphincter, of course, squeezes it closed like this. There's a muscle in the deep one, which I don't think I have an image of, so I'm gonna try and show here. So for men, we've got the opening for the anus and the urethral opening. So I've drawn pen in this deep muscle that starts on the pubic bone, and it loops around all three openings to the other side. Does that sort of make sense? So on the picture here, it would, it would loop around the anus and urethra, come behind it, and come to the other pubic bone. So it's like a sling. So when this muscle contracts, actually on this picture it works, when this muscle contracts, it slings forward and it compresses the urethra against the pubic bone, so it helps to press it closed from behind. So that sling muscle, combined with the urethral sphincter, help to close and keep the urine in. And both those muscles come in when the, when the person thinks of tightening from the anus. Does that make sense so far? Okay. Now, what happens when they take out the prostate? Here's the tricky part. There's another sphincter, so this is the external urethral external anus sphincter. This is the external urethral sphincter. It's under our volitional control. We can tell it to tighten. There's another sphincter called the internal urethral sphincter that is continuous within. It, some of its fibers come along the, uh, the, the neck of the bladder and down into the beginning of the urethra, and some of the fibers are continuous with the prostate. So this internal urethral sphincter that helps to close here a lot of it's removed when you have your prostate taken out. So they do the best they can, but in order to get the prostate out, they take out a lot of the internal sphincter. So we're still left with some closure capability, um, but some of the involuntary automatic control from that internal sphincter is gone with the prostate. Now, I spoke to, when I was in Vancouver, a urologist, uh, Dr. Vu Trong, and I was speaking to him about the variability because some men come out of pro radical prostatectomy and, and are dry, don't have much incontinence at all, and some have a lot. Like I've seen, on the worst case scenario, I've, I've seen um, a gentleman who, so we assess, it, I assess them both lying and in standing because it's, usually incontinence is worse than standing, right? Like if you're lying, if you're lying in bed or if you've been sitting for a long period of time, there's usually not as much incontinence as when you stand up, or when you walk, or when you bend over, right? So against gravity, because those muscles have to work against gravity. So usually incontinence is worse, is worse than standing. So this one gentleman that I've seen, when he, he had good pelvic floor control, when he stood up, he kept his muscles tight by thinking of tightening them. But when he let go of it, it was like a faucet, like someone had turned on a faucet, like it was a full stream, it would just come out versus I've seen someone that just had little dribbles here and there. Um, any type of incontinence, if it's bothersome to you, you can absolutely seek treatment. And what we can do with pelvic floor exercises is get you connected to your muscles, making sure you're doing your exercises properly, maximize what you can do with your muscle, and see where that gets you. Because it might get you to where you're happy. It might get you to be completely continent. We don't know until we try. Because there are other things too, like nerve damage that can happen. Um, nerve recovery can happen, can come back up to a year. So you might see benefits up till there. I have a couple slides later that research shows that doing properly done exercises can expedite your recovery. So get you to drier faster um, and improve quality of life outcomes and things like that. So when I was speaking to Dr. Vu Trong, the urologist in Vancouver, he said it's a poorly understood mechanism of why some men have more incontinence post-op 
compared to others. Um, and he, he said he's not, they're not entirely sure why. Um, and, but there is something that you can do about it. Physiotherapy is one of them. Everybody okay so far? Okay. So stress incontinence. This is the type of incontinence that can occur after radical prostatectomy because the, when the prostate's removed, a lot of the internal urethral sphincter is removed as well too. So here again, we have the bladder, the urethra, the blue line, and then the pelvic floor muscles down at the bottom. So what happens with stress incontinence is when there's increased pressure within the abdomen, which can happen when you, when you sneeze, achoo, or cough, or lift something, or bend over, it's physical stress that happens in the abdomen that pushes down on the bladder. And if the pelvic floor closure mechanisms aren't strong enough to withstand the pressures coming down from a sneeze, or a cough, or a lift, or lifting the leg, um, then the urine can sneak out. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it's basically just a, a pressure differential. So, there's the leak. <coughs> We talked about this. So one of the treatments for, for stress incontinence is doing pelvic floor exercises, strengthening up the closure mechanism. This was the muscles I was talking about, the two different layers, the superficial muscles and the deep layer. Lots of names. Different roles of the pelvic floor, one of them we're addressing today is continence, keeping in what you want in. So what is a pelvic floor contraction or what is a Kegel or a Kegel? Dr. Kegel or Kegel uh, is a guy that was a gynecologist that in the 80s coined the, well, yeah, I guess he didn't coin the term, but he, he first documented that we could exercise these muscles, and so they named it after him. And so most often women, or you've heard about it, talk, spoken to women in childbearing or postpartum or menopause, but men, we can exercise these too, and you can really resolve, uh, do a good job of continence. So this is what I was talking about before. You need to have correct technique. And so based on a bunch of these studies, in the latest MO in 2009, they found that 75% of women in this study uh, weren't doing a contraction properly, greater than. So written or verbal instruction is often insufficient, which is what most people get from your physician, from the internet, is here's a sheet, you should go home and do your Kegels. But when you're not doing it right, you might not get anywhere. So you gotta make sure you're doing it right. Why is there so much confusion? So with the pelvic floor contraction, there are other muscles that are supposed to contract. Totally different muscles, but they're wired to fire together. So one of the muscles that you may have heard of, especially from personal trainers or fitness classes, or maybe from your physio, is your core, your core abdominals. So your transversus abdominis, which is the deepest layer in your abdominals, totally different muscle than your pelvic floor. So these muscles are up here. But when you tighten your pelvic floor, if everything's working properly, the deepest layer of abdominal muscles should also co-contract. But here's the trouble, is that often we're more aware of our abdominals than we are of our pelvic floor. So sometimes we start with properly, with good intention, the pelvic floor contraction, we sense consciously or subconsciously the abdominals and we start to hold them instead, and then you lose the pelvic floor. So then you're holding the wrong muscle. Or, which I'll get into in the next slide, other abdominal muscles come in, obliques. So external obliques, internal obliques, which fixate your ribs, increase intra-abdominal pressure, which will actually push down and work against you. So that's one way that you can do it wrong. Really, really common. In fact, one of the most common people using too much abdominals. And it's not that your abs shouldn't be involved, but there's certain abs that should and certain that aren't. And so it's really hard to know am I doing this right or not. So that's why I help teach people how to figure that out. The multifidus and the diaphragm also work in as well. The multifidus is a really deep spinal stabilizer that run uh, one to two vertebral segments above and below, all the way up the spine and all the way down. So it helps to stabilize the spine. That's supposed to happen. And also the diaphragm, the respiratory diaphragm is affected. You should still be able to inhale and exhale, but when they've done fine wire EMG studies on the diaphragm, when a person does a pelvic floor contraction, there's variations to the diaphragm. And how many people are more aware of their breath than their pelvic floor? So when you, people sense a change to their breath when they're trying to do a pelvic floor contraction, they might end up holding their breath. Another way that you can make it worse, because if you hold your breath, it increases pressure while again push down on the pelvic floor. So, really common ways that you can get it wrong and that you can actually make it worse. So what, um, I was speaking to a client and telling them about this and, she, and it was a woman in this case and she said, oh, it's kind of like they're a side effect. These muscles are a side effect. You want the, the focus to be on the pelvic floor and these other guys are side effect but not the focus. So I thought that was a, a good way to, to look at it. Another analogy which 
some might appreciate is a sports analogy. So let's say we use uh, hockey. So we've got different muscles on the same team, the pelvic floor, the deep abdominals, the diaphragm, the deep back muscles. They're on the same hockey team. You can control, you can give the puck to the abs, and I can teach people how to use their abs properly, and you can pass the puck down to your pelvic floor. And when you give the puck to the pelvic floor, the deep abs should come along, they're on the same team. And you can pass the puck to the abs, and the pelvic floor should come along. But what we want to be able to do is be able to control the puck from the pelvic floor and keep it where you want it to be because that's where you get where you're going to get the maximum benefit. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's that's the team that's supposed to come in. Then there's oh, then here's research showing that they come together. It's supposed to be research based, which is actually. <laughs> um, then there's another team, totally different team, not part of the pelvic floor, but they try and come in to help out. So we got our glutes, right? It's, buttock muscles here that are close to the pelvic floor, they try and help out, but they're not part of the pelvic floor at all, and they end up taking away from what you're doing. Uh, the adductors, which is the inner thigh muscles, again, so they're close to the pelvic floor, they come into the pubic bone, and so sometimes people squeeze their legs, their legs together or their thighs to try and get the contraction strong. Or again, the abdominals, so external obliques or internal obliques. So these are totally different parts of the body, not part of the pelvic floor. And often, when people are trying to get a strong contraction, these muscles come in. And what ends up happening is you end up squeezing all these other muscles and the pelvic floor is nowhere to be found. So it's really, let's see if this next slide does it. We'll go back. Oops. Um, really, it's about, I have a slide coming up, how it's actually more of a skill than it is strength. Yes, we want it strong. Yes, we want endurance. But we first need to figure out how to find the tool and use the tool properly. Because you can go on squeezing the wrong thing and you'll get nowhere. Tight butt, maybe. <laughs> and tight thighs, but you're not going to help conscience. OK. So different ways to think about tightening your pelvic floor. So we spoke about tightening anus or, or stopping the flow of pee. Side note. A lot of people might have heard this, but when you go pee, like you're at the toilet, you're going pee, or the urinal, it's not a good idea to, as you're going pee to stop the flow of urine. And especially to do that over and over again. It's, it's one way to check, and if you want to do it, we say like once a week is a good idea to do it, not no more often than that. Do you remember way back at the beginning, way back at the beginning of the presentation, uh, when I said when you tighten your pelvic floor, it sends a message to the bladder to calm it down? So when we go pee, we go to the bathroom, we get ready undressed, the pelvic floor muscles are tight and the bladder is relaxed holding the urine. So when we go pee, the muscles of the pelvic floor relax to open and the bladder contracts to get the urine out. So if while you're going pee, you tighten your pelvic floor muscles, you actually send a message to the bladder to say stop contracting. So it can sometimes get confused which can lead to you not completely emptying the bladder, which can lead to residual, which is residual urine, which, which may increase the risk of getting a urinary tract infection. So it's not a good idea to do that all the time. And some people come in and say, well, that's how I do my exercises while I'm peeing. I stop and start and stop and start. That's actually not a good idea. So if you want to do that to test once a week, you don't need to do more than that. And if you're going to do it, don't do it while you're full stream, midstream. Do it more towards the end of the pee, and then try and tighten and stop the flow of urine. Does that make sense? OK. Another cue that can work well for men is imagining or pulling up um, from the testicles, or pulling penis towards the body, or thinking of shortening the penis. Those are different ways to think of and, and cue. So this is where physiotherapy is sort of an art. We're figuring out for that person specifically what works best for them to understand to get the desired muscular effect and result. But for most people, like I said, tightening from the anus is one of the best ways to go about it. Uh, everybody's good so far. Okay. Excuse me? Yes. Um, tightening from the anus and restraining, <coughs> when do you know that you're tightening from the anus correctly yeah. as opposed to squeezing the glutes? Yes. Good question. So what I do is I put one hand on the glutes with permission. So one hand on the glutes and, and I assess and I feel, well, you can do that yourself as well too. So, um, and it's actually, that's actually a really good question because uh, see this deep muscle here, the vader ani, is, is deep, sort of in the middle. You guys okay if I show you my butt? <laughs> I'll be appropriate, I promise. Okay, so here's buttock muscles, right? So this is this is glutes contraction. So when you tighten your pelvic floor, um, you, if if a person is undressed or wearing really tight clothes, you might be able to see like within the perineum lift up a little bit, but you shouldn't see like this. 
So you can put your hands right on your buttocks and you can kind of jiggle them to make sure they're relaxed before you start. And if you start to feel it squeezing your hand, that's a cue, that's how you kind of tell if it's those guys. But if you can kind of jiggle them throughout when you're trying to do a Kegel, you're not squeezing the glutes, you're in the right spot. Does that sort of help? Yeah, okay. It can be tricky. Okay, good. Um, so, different things you can watch. Good segue. So, when you get a pelvic floor contraction, if you're watching in a mirror or watching yourself, your testicles, when you do a contraction, probably will draw in. The penis will draw in. You can feel a rope between the testicles and anus. So, this is where I was saying you can put your fingertip or fingertips between the base of the test or the base of the penis and testicles and the anus. And when men contract the pelvic floor, they'll be like a, uh, it feels like a rope sort of thickens and pops out. So you'll be able to feel that. So you can put your own hand there. Um, now usually, in standing you can do it, you can do it from the front, but I think it's a little bit easier from behind. And in sitting can be helpful too. Uh, standing, you want to make sure that you're relaxed because the hard part is that sometimes if you have your foot up on something, you're sort of balancing. So using two feet on the floor is better, or you can sit right down and get your hand in that area. Because um, the trick is keeping all of the other muscles that aren't supposed to come in out of it. Does that make sense? So you should be able to feel a rope um, between there. You want to make sure it's not abdominal lead. So if you feel a little bit of the low abdominals come in, that part's okay, but it should only be a little bit and it shouldn't be the guy with the puck. You should be really focusing and feeling it from the anus and that's the best way to contract it. And like you were saying, not a gluteal or a butt contraction from the outside. Unless you were wearing tights, no one would know. If they were really watching that spot between your buttocks, between your bum cheeks, they will, they'll have no idea. From the outside, you shouldn't be able to see anything, and your breathing should be normal. So if you're holding your breath, or if you finish a contraction and you let go, you were holding your breath. So different things to watch for. So this is where it's more of a skill. So you, you can't really muscle through playing a piano. To be a good piano player, you, have, you want to have good fingering, good motor control. Um, you know, it's a skill, it's, and it's about controlling the pelvic floor, not forcing it. So, because again, that forcing, you're trying to go for strength, brings in all these other muscles, like even up to jaw, or eyebrows, or toes curl, or shin muscles. It's really amazing how many things try and come in and jump in. <laughs> so, pelvic floor rehabilitation, it, it's a really a skill. Can you find the right tool? Can you find the right muscle? Difficult to do, and the ability to find the right muscle is the contribution. Yeah. To contract it is different than the ability to hold it, which is the H, which is different than the ability to relax it. Um, and so we want to make sure that the person has perfect control over finding the muscles. Can they contract it? Can they hold it? Can they relax it? Um, we want to build strength, yes, and endurance. And to build strength, it's against gravity in standing. Because these muscles, when you tighten in standing, have to lift against gravity. And that's where it's more functional, too. There's usually more continence against gravity. Endurance, we want to do it as many reps and have a, a length or duration of holding the contraction so that you start to build endurance benefits so that if you're going for a longer walk or sometimes the scenario is in the morning, I have a client I'm seeing right now, if he goes for his walk at 7 a.m., he has a little bit of incontinence, mildly saturates his pad versus he does the exact same walk later in the afternoon, completely saturated pad. And that's because of muscle endurance. Because during the day when you stand, when you walk, when you sneeze, when you brush your teeth, when you're any time against gravity, your muscles have to be working and if they don't have endurance, you'll be leaking more at the end of the day. So if that's the case, pelvic floor strengthening endurance training might really help. Um, and then the last piece is functional integration, using the muscle when you need it to. So one way to put it is having a strong muscle doesn't mean anything if you don't know how to use it. Now, remember that internal urethral sphincter, that's it. part of the prostate, it's part of automatic continence control. A lot of that automatic control is lost when they take the prostate out. So what we're left with is voluntary volitional control, us teaching of tightening the pelvic floor, when you sneeze, when you cough, when you lift, when you bend over, when you stand up, things like that, whatever task causes incontinence for you. Um, so it means having to think about it. Uh, so basically, I make a joke, if anus is the best way to contract the person's pelvic floor, which for most people it is, I say I teach people to be anal retentive, but in a good way. <laughs> so you're going to stand up, tighten from the anus, and keep it in as you stand up. Um, if you're going to lift your grandchild, you're going to tighten your anus and lift your grandchild, right? That kind of thing. So, but it, but it, it, it can really work. Now, does that mean, and people will ask, and you might be thinking, does that mean I have to tighten my anus all the damn time? 
<laughs> yes and no. Um, it's, here's, here's where it's tricky, is that there is some return of automatic function, and we're not sure how or why, and we think it could be a couple of different things. You know, um, habits, like biting your nails or um, picking your nails, it's something that you can do without consciously thinking. So if you get good at tightening your hands before you lift, sneeze, cough, carry, push, pull, exercise, get up from a chair, you start to get good at, it starts to be the habit, right? So how much of it is a person just getting used to doing that? Um, how much of it is neuroplasticity, which is basically the brain rewiring and, and becoming back automatic? So we're not entirely sure, but it, there is some return that comes back and, and it can really be helpful. Um, some neurologists recommend waiting for catheter removal before starting or resuming pelvic floor exercises. So a urologist I spoke to in Vancouver as well, uh, who's now retired, but he said he's, he was okay with doing them with the catheter in. So basically ask your urologist or ask your, your surgeon. Um, never, they should, they should never be painful. So if you ever do them and they're causing discomfort, stop, wait a couple of days, then try again. Um, so yeah, just double check with your physician what they say. Yes. The comment from mine was, yes. um, he said he's got all sorts of work in very fine small stitches. All sorts and, of, yeah. And so he wanted me to avoid pulling them all out right. and doing a contraction. Right. Fair enough, and I don't want to go with That's what the doctor says. Yes, absolutely. Did he say when a time frame was for you to start doing them? Well, when the catheter was removed. Yeah, so that sounds good to me. And it depends on the, the surgeon, but I've, I know that some uh, surgeons leave them in for two weeks, three weeks. How long are you guys left to catheter in? Depending on your surgeon, you can just call it out. Three weeks. Three weeks. Ten days, three Ten weeks. Ten days, three Ten weeks. Two weeks. Week. Week, two weeks. Isn't it funny that they did different variability? I don't know. So that's, that's great. So I go with what your physician says. Yeah, don't, yeah, don't go in. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. One comment. Great. Help um, it floor physiotherapy for continence. I yes. have the incontinence. I want the continence. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> so uh, uh, any, anyway, that's a good comment. Yes. Um, I have no stress incontinence. Yes. I have the relaxation incontinence. Meaning that when I relax doing something, yes, I get a drip. Right. As opposed to, uh, I can react for all the stress stuff. Right. So what are the tasks that cause the relaxation of confidence? I just lean over. Right. Or uh, I'll get up, walk across the room, look at the calendar. Yeah. And when I stop at that point. Right. Now, in times when you cough or sneeze or lift, are you intentionally tightening your yeah. floor? Yeah. I, I'm reacting well in advance of right. the stress. Do you think that if you were to, when you leaned over, Intentionally tighten your pelvic floor. Yeah, I know exactly. So that's so what's, it's when I'm relaxing. That's right. And so that's where you automatically those muscles are supposed to be kicking in for you, but they're not. And for each person, it's individual. So for you, it might exactly it might just be leaning over. So even with things like leaning over, you want to go anus, come on in, or whatever the cue is, is you come in. And you must be on the right track because you're able to stop the flow of urine. So you've got to be more aware with more tasks of pulling it in, and it'll get easier and easier as you go. But yeah, absolutely. And I know what you mean, it's that shift in the paradigm that we're aiming for continence. So why wouldn't we phrase it positively as continence? I think that's a good comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, any other questions or comments so far? Okay. So this was the, the functional integration of getting the muscle to work when it's supposed to. Because let's say, for example, you sneeze. Let's say these muscles are super strong. They're super, super, duper strong, like Olympic strength. But you sneeze, and the muscles are out having a smoke and a coffee break. <laughs> They'll still eat, right? So if you lean over and the muscles are having a smoke and a coffee break, you gotta tighten them in. So we gotta be able to integrate it into function. Teach it when it's like, hey, you, you're supposed to be coming in right now, tighten up. Um, so, you know, when you walk, when you run, when you lift, when you exercise, bend, cough, ski, sit to stand, all that sort of stuff, intentionally tighten your pelvic floor. And it can range from just leaning over, it can range from one sneeze, but not another sneeze. It can range from the first two sneezes, you're okay, but it's the third sneeze. Or it can depend on early in the day, you're okay, but at the end of the day. So, doing it every time can be helpful, because if you don't know when it's going to happen, you're just going to get, and also get used to have it habitually doing it. You know, retentive. Oh, what? Yes. Um, so if you go back to the yeah. slide, some of the activities that you mentioned, yeah. I'll say singular, you're standing up, you're bending over, you're right. sneezing, you're coughing, but yeah. some of them, like walking, running, are continuous activities. Are continuous. So are you supposed to tighten your anus the whole entire time? I sure like to go for a five mile run. I know. All my <laughs> I know. I know. I know. And this is where I go. 
I need a light. I don't know. Throw the pain in there. So, <laughs> so, well, I know. What's supposed to happen? So this is what I say for these continual activities is, do I expect you and should you expect you to run with your pelvic floor tight the entire time? No, because that's not really realistic. Now, let's look at before there was any trouble. So when, we, when we're standing, the pelvic floor is supposed to have a certain level of low level tension to help keep urinating. If we walk at a certain pace, it's supposed to tighten a little bit more to meet the speed of walking. As we step up the pace, it's supposed to tighten a bit more. And if we jump, it should tighten a bit more. So it's supposed to be responsive. So on a slide coming up, I, I, one of the tools I use is EMG biofeedback. So I have little sensors, just like heart rate monitors, where these two little stickies go on either side of the anus, and it'll pick up the contraction. So we see it on the screen on a line graph. So sometimes I get the person, as they're standing, we see the resting tool, and I say, walk on the spot. And you can see it tends a bit more. And if you start to walk a bit faster, it tenses a bit more. And if they jump, it spikes up. That's how it's supposed to happen. Sometimes it doesn't, and I can say, well, that's why you're leaking. Or sometimes it does, but not very much. Now, so why that's relevant to running, knowing that realistically, if you're going for a walk, that your pelvic floor muscle wouldn't be right up at the top the whole time anyways. So when you're going for a walk, words that we sort of use is become aware and encourage your pelvic floor to come in and notice it. And as you're going for your walk, if you know how to find your pelvic floor as you're going for your walk, just sort of pay attention and, and notice. Do you feel the anus coming in if that's your cue coming in? And if it's not, sort of encourage it to come in a little bit. And not all the way to the top, because that's not what it does anyways. But just sort of encourage it in and you just do the best that you can. Um, and same, same idea with running sort of thing. And with the idea, with these exercises, what we're building up towards is the ability to hold a contraction for 10 whole seconds while breathing without grabbing any other muscle. So in standing, hold for 10 seconds rest for 10 seconds, 30 repetitions in a row in standing. So that's basically 10 minutes of doing these exercises that really pushes the muscles into what we call overload principle, which really builds strength, builds endurance. And once a person's able to do that confidently, there's usually some good carryover to continuous activities like walking and running, things like that. So it's not an easy, it's not kind of dry, pun intended, but yeah, does that help answer? So are you saying to do your Held your Kegel exercise yeah. standing. Yeah. See, I, I've always been sitting to do that. Yeah. I yeah. Know that's, yeah. That's fine. And yeah. 30 repetitions. I do. Once a day. That's right. Once a person can do 30 repetitions of those 10 second holds, once a day is all you need. But that's so all. I've been doing them three times a day. Yeah. 10. Yeah. That's not as good. That's right. Because what, if you shorten the rest period in between, it further pushes the muscles. Like, let's say if you're doing 30 squats in a day and you do 10 in the morning, 10 in the afternoon, 10 in the you're going to get stronger, but not as strong as you would get if you did 30 in a row. You really want to push the muscle, but then the question is, are you doing them right? And that's kind of piece too, but yeah, exactly. That's what we're building towards. Yeah. 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 Yes? If you're not having incontinence problems, yes. should you be doing the Kegel exercises? It's a good question. Um, Sometimes, like I've seen men who have had, and this would make sense if they've had uh, this prostatectomy, uh, not having incontinence or much, and it's not bothersome, but they're requiring further treatment like brachytherapy or radiation, then absolutely it makes sense to be doing exercises preventatively. Um, there is an aging component, absolutely, that can happen, and more often happens with women, especially if there's um, a history of vaginal delivery and those sorts of things and declining estrogen. But yes, as a preventative measure, I would say as a physiotherapist looking through the world, you my physiotherapy glasses, you can prevent onset and incontinence in later life. And the number, I do know that the number one reason for admission into long-term care is, is, is incontinence. The number two reason is incontinence, the first is dementia. So if you can keep uh, pelvic floor control I mean, a different reasons for incontinence might be happening too. Might be what we call functional incontinence, where they've lost mobility, so the person can't physically get to the toilet in time, can't get out of the chair, or that sort of thing. But yeah, it's a good idea preventatively to do them. Yeah, and it is a lifelong thing. People ask that, so I need to do this for the rest of my life. Kind of, sorta. It's a user to lose it kind of muscle. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, what are your causes of incontinence here? I mean, remember, I don't have this yet. Yes. Um, have to do with grunt exercises, I'll call it that. Okay. Like lifting, bending, coughing, okay, or running. Right. I don't do any of that. I right. swim. Yeah. Now, how does that relate to. Yeah. Be so people that do grunt exercises, as you call them, which makes sense, which would increase intra abdominal pressure, 
if you took the same person and they did swimming versus the grunt exercises, the person who did grunt exercises would experience incontinence more because they're doing more <coughs> intra-abdominal pressure things. So um, that's, it's an actually interesting point. And from my understanding on the research, they, they, they do person continent after radical prostatectomy if they use one pad or less a day. So for a lot of men, they would say, well, that's not incontinent at all. And I remember I saw uh, 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 an anesthesiologist um, I always get those wrong, <laughs> confused, but uh, so he had prostate cancer, really highly motivated, and he came in and he said, you know what, if I am sedentary, if I sit in my butt, don't really go do much of a walk, if I don't do much, I don't leak much, but that's not how I want to live. These are the activities that I want to do, and so depending on what you do or what you want to do may incur symptoms more than others. So for swimming, it's actually a nice choice because it's less impactful, it's less stress, um, yeah, and it's hard to, yeah. So, it might be a better choice in terms of it'll be applying less pressure down to the pelvic floor. That's what I was wondering. Yeah. I, mean, I can have a heart screw. Yeah. You know, I don't just splash around. No, that's good. That's good. That's good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Um, not to say that if someone wants to get to walking or someone wants to do those grunt exercises that we, you know, might not be able to build pelvic floor strength to be able to get to do what you want. Because it really depends on what that person wants to do, right? That's their quality of life. Uh, sometimes there's a bit of a compromise, but but yeah, we want to we want to achieve best what the person as best we can to what they, they want kind of thing. But it's a good exercise choice. Okay, so here's the research supporting it. So there's some studies that show that doing pelvic floor exercises, properly done supervised pelvic floor exercises, and exercises, it quickens the return to continence. Um, so a couple of studies there. And preoperatively doing pelvic floor exercises, so before surgery, improves continence and quality of life outcomes after radical prostatectomy, like the 2010 study. So often women are in pregnancy are told to do their Kegels. Uh, it's it thought because it's a preventative measure. Learn how to find these muscles and how to strengthen them so you can better rehabilitate after after delivery. Same idea preoperatively. And again, I had a urologist who before he would do surgery, as soon as he uh, knew that this was going to happen, he sent them down. We were in the same building. He sent us sent the, the men down, and they learned how to do pelvic floor exercises when there wasn't a problem. But learning how to find the muscles so they could expedite recovery after. So biofeedback, some studies here, early biofeedback not only quickens recovery of incontinence after <coughs> prostatectomy, but allows for significant improvements in severity of incontinence, voiding symptoms, and pelvic floor muscle strengths at one year post-op. So two studies. So here's uh, an example of the, of the biofeedback. So it's external sensors. So there are, there are uh, biofeedback sensors that have probes, like one going in the anus. Um, what I use at the clinic are external sensors, so perianal sensors. They're like little stickies, like heart rate monitors, and one goes on either side of the outside of the anus. So when you tighten your pelvic floor, it grasps it. So it's really neat because you can see it. And so this is um, just different versions of exercises, and, and you can see it shows the variability of a hold kind of thing. So a lot of people, when they think, so I say, okay, try and do a contraction, and they might have the idea, and they get the right thought. But then I say, okay, now try holding this and breathing at the same time. And often what happens is a person does a contraction, and as they try and hold or think they're holding, isn't it just fizzling away? Mm -hmm. And by the time they've let go, it's already gone. And now their glutes are letting go, because that's where the puck went. Or now their shoulders are letting go, kind of thing. So again, it's figuring out how to find those right muscles. And a lot of us are visual learners, so it helps in assessment for me as well, but also for treatment to see what you're doing, seeing if you're getting it right. There are other assistive devices that can help for incontinence as well, too. So, um, Sean might talk about some of these things as well, but what I want to say with these with these clamps is check with your physician first because some physicians would prefer you not to use them until one year post-op. So check with them, and if there's any clamps, you want to read the, the instructions. So there's the Acti cup at the very bottom is a uh, disposable one. The Cunningham clamp and the J clamp, they're all the same idea, that they compress the urethra, so you put them on your penis. So what I've been told is that it's a bit of a sensation that you feel for the first 15 or 20 minutes, but then you forget, what you kind of get, your nerves get accommodated and you don't sense it. It does compress blood flow. The J clamp has a little notch in the top that's supposed to allow more blood flow. Um, the Cunningham is a straight off clamp, and same with the Acti cuff, but read the directions, uh, check with your physician, but basically it helps to compress the urethra. Not something that you want to wear continuously, you want to take it off every two hours, each product usually says or so void, leave it for 30 minutes, let blood flow return, and then put it back on, but this can be a nice device that can help if you want to go swimming, or if you're going to be on the airplane, 
or things like that. Now, the Cunningham clamp and the J clamp have metal, so it would ring on a metal detector. Ding a little bit, exactly. Uh, and uh, there is one, um, a plastic one on the market, and uh, so it, yeah, there's different, there's different assistive devices, but this can help with quality of life because you want to enjoy your moments, right? You want to get out and experience, and it, or if you're wearing it to go to the gym, and then you should get off after the gym kind of thing. And, and in terms of physiotherapy and learning your muscles, it's I, I wouldn't want a person to be wearing this all the time, either because then you don't get a chance to use and practice your exercises and use your muscles when you need to kind of thing. But to know that there are things like this out there, but check with your physician. Um, yeah, so so far good, so good so far with these. Uh, Active Cup you order online, J clamps online, Cunningham clamp. Um, most medical suppliers have them, but I've heard a lot of people prefer the J clamp over the Cunningham. And that's it. Thank you. Yes. 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 That acts on pressure, and right. they, you know the pressure builds up yeah. to a point, and it opens up. Right. Pressure goes away, and it closes. Yeah. It. Or some other way. I mean, that, that's yeah. just a physical way. Maybe there's some. I mean, with with pacemaker. I mean, some sort mm -hmm. of a sensor or something that you could. Yeah. I mean, a valve, something that you can open. You can yeah. open and close it, or that work. I mean, it seems so. The concept seems so simple yeah. when you consider all the. Tremendous advances yeah. in all the medical yeah. technology. Yeah. Yeah. It just seems like a, yeah. a really simple yeah. device, like a little thing that just, you know, I mean, it, you know, people use these things in plumbing. And, oh, right. <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> and this is plumbing. Yes. Yes. Pressure yes. sensitive valve. Yes. That, you know, yeah. just the pressure builds up yeah. to a point and it opens. Yeah. Runs out and closes. From my understanding, there is something similar to what you're describing, um, uh, artificial sphincter. So I've been in Victoria for a year and I'm learning the urologist. Um, I, I do know there's a urologist in, he's technically in, in Richmond, so in the lower mainland, Dr. Dr. Rappaport, who does do external, uh, or sorry, does artificial sphincters as well as a male sling. So, um, I believe the, ex the artificial sphincter is like you were describing, and I think there's some sort of device that the person presses. I'm not sure how they're instructed to use it, but it's something like what you were describing. So it's further surgery, so there's risks with that, but there is such a thing. Um, and the, you read the, the male sling. So women sometimes often can have this sling put in after they've had uh, vaginal delivery because the, the vagina and the supporting musculature can be stretched out and the urethra moves too much. And you know it's interesting because that might be part of it too with the prostate. There's a volume now where that used to support the urethra now that's taken out. So if there's more space in there for it to move it around. So is there more hypermobility in the urethra and that's contributing to the incontinence? It's absolutely possible. So with this sling, what they do is they, they put uh, through this hole here, they have it like a, a mesh. Um, so in women they call it transvaginal tape, but in this they call it a, a male sling. So it goes in through here and it loops underneath the neck of the urethra. And so it stiffens it up. Basically it's like this. So again, it's a surgery, but Dr. Rappaport does it. Do I have access to internet here? Do you know? Sean, do you have access to internet? No. I can try. I can try, okay. Um, here we go. Oh, how do I type them? Oh, uh, the keyboard is uh, just underneath the computer. Ooh, here we are. So, Metro Man Urology, this is Dr. Rappaport's clinic, and I apologize because there might be someone on the island, I'm not entirely sure, but his website is pretty, um, I find it's pretty helpful. So let's look at here, procedures and surgery, uh, incontinence and prolapse, male artificial urinary sphincter and male sling. Okay, so he's got the description of the procedure. There's the sling, so here it comes in underneath, and so they tense that up. Um, there's the risk, bleeding, infection, urinary hypertension. Sometimes it doesn't work, failure to improve. Uh, you know, so there's, there's risks, right? What to expect, caution. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty good website. Um, let's go back here. Let's look at the artificial sphincter. I haven't looked at this in a while. Three-piece hydraulic prosthesis. It's a replacement for your urinary valve sphincter mechanism. 
Um, so let's see if there's any pictures. There's a brochure. Resources are available. It's not helpful. So, anyways, there's a bit of information about that as well too. Uh, Grand incision. Yeah. So uh, it's an implantation. It's it's basically what you're expecting, right? Well, I mean, I was thinking more of the name Turnbull as opposed to the thing they're around. Yeah. Or either more of an internal thing, like a stent is put up inside an artery or a vein. Right. And like a micro valve in a heart. Like yeah. pressure builds up, they open, pressure goes away, they close. Right. So I mean that's how a micro valve works in the heart. Is that so I'm just thinking, I mean obviously the right. artery is bigger. But then you need to find out a way to when it's at a certain amount so that you go when it opens at an appropriate time. So that no, right, that's what it would just be based on like if, if it was set so that it, like enough pressure built right. up. Right. Like, like maybe you feel the pressure, just a natural thing, like pressure builds up. Because that's what happens so in normal yeah, physiological function. You, you, yeah. you, you wouldn't know. Yeah. That. Yeah. So, I, I know. I hear you. I know. And I'm not a surgeon. I sort think of you need to feel that. <laughs> I know. I, I know. I completely agree. So a better question for a surgeon, they may have exactly a I kind of be a researcher. Or be a researcher, exactly your biomedical engineering kind of thing. Yeah, I know. I hear you. I hear you. Yeah. Smartphone app. The smartphone app. <laughs> There's lots of apps for everything up there. And I've got a bunch off the top of my head that I'm not gonna spit off. <laughs> Yeah, it's time to go pee, exactly. I know. There probably will be. That's a serious thing we Yeah. There's like, yeah. Yeah. There's apps that they can facilitate and, and uh, what's the word, enable if you have urgency incontinence. So sometimes people who have really sudden strong urges to go pee, one of the ways they try and manage is they just go to the toilet as often as they can, just empty this damn thing so it doesn't bother me. Uh, but the problem is that you can condition your bladder to be going so frequently. And, uh, and especially say, for example, you come home, and if the first thing you do when you come home is go pee, the bladder starts to know, hey, we're home. And even if it's not that full, it goes, it's time to pee. And if the muscles aren't strong enough, then you can leave. Or before you leave the house, or before you get in the shower, or you know things like that. So by frequently going pee, you can actually enable urgency, incontinence, and frequency. So what I was saying before, this is that there's an app that'll tell you where all different public toilets are. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get it. And get this, there's an app that's called, I think it's called Run P app or something, but they, they, these people I'm sure with these problems go to movies that are, are currently out, and they tell you when's the most boring time in the movie, when you should go pee, and they tell you the synopsis of what you're missing. I know. I know. I know. So it's interesting, and this is an interesting piece actually relevant to stress incontinence, is that it makes sense that if there's stress incontinence that people often will avoid more frequently to empty the bladder, because the more volumes in the bladder, the more often they'll be leaking. Which I totally understand, but you want to watch to make sure that Again, just being wary that you're not getting into habitual frequent voiding because the bladder picks up on that and it goes, oh, he wants me to empty when I'm only this full. Well, I'll start to signal him when I'm only this full. So it's, it's, it's a fine line. Yeah. We want to be the boss of our bladder, ID, right? Be calm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Good question. Okay. So is there an exercise that can be done? Like take yeah. a certain amount of water and then wait? And well, that's actually, yeah, well, in part of it, if people have urgency or frequency incontinence, what part of what I do for assessment is I send them home with a diary, and I get them to fill out how much fluid they drink and the type of fluid, and then I get them to, when they go pee, what, write down what time it was and how much they actually go pee, so you pee into a measuring cup or something of the sort that measures, because I want to see the volume. That tells me if the bladder was actually full or not, and then we identify from there, is it abnormal or not, because... Sometimes, yeah, it's, it's interesting, sometimes people report they have a small bladder, but on their bladder diary it comes back, it's actually appropriate volumes, and some people think that they're peeing a lot, but when they come back, it's like a quarter of a cup or a third of a cup, so a really small amount. So the first thing I do is an assessment, I get them to fill out a voiding diary to see if it's, if it's appropriate or not, and then I make suggestions depending on fluid intake, type of fluid, and then if they're going pee frequently at small volumes, I teach them, yeah, to, to, if you have an urge, here's a couple of tricks, including a pelvic floor contraction, a way to talk to your bladder, checking with your mind, to, if you get an urge, calm your bladder down and say, no bladder, I don't think you're that full yet, you hold and wait what you've got there, and then when the urge comes back, like depending on the diary says, then, then go kind of thing, so you increase its, its capacity to hold, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's neat, you can really help. Thank you very much. Okay.